Hi everybody, I'm Chris Kamish and this is Tricks of the Trade, learning how to learn computer science. Today's video is about SSH. We're going to be covering the absolute basics about how to log in using SSH, create SSH keys, use SSH agents, and that type of thing. The first thing that we're going to go over though is the very, very basics of the cryptography that underlies SSH. We're going to go over it conceptually, but not mathematically. If you want to learn a little bit more about the security behind SSH, or the cryptography of how the math works out, I definitely suggest you take a course on that. But for now, this is just the absolute basics. So when we're using SSH, we are fundamentally creating a key that we're going to use to log into a bunch of different places. And the exciting part about it is that we're using public key cryptography. So when we create a key, we actually break it into two pieces. And these two pieces are broken in a very special way where one part functions as a lock and one part functions as a key. So what I can do is I can take the lock part and I can put it on a lot of different machines anywhere I want to be able to log in and prove to somebody else that I am who I say I am. And I'm going to keep that key part here to myself. And what I can do is I can say, okay, anywhere that that lock exists, I can log in, I can prove to somebody that I have the only key that fits that lock and actually makes it turn and functionally works. I keep that key to myself and I put lock everywhere else, I can do something very, very useful. I can log into those machines without having to memorize a really long password and to have, I'll have a lot more security than I would have otherwise. That's conceptually the way that SSH public key cryptography works. But rather than having a key and a lock, that's our metaphor, what we have instead is a private key and a public key. So the lock is the public key. So I put the lock lots of different places and the private key is the key, the thing I keep to myself. Now in this demo, we're going to be keeping keys only on our own machine and we're going to use those to log into other machines. And we're going to use those to log into those machines and then log into other machines beyond them through that machine, keeping our key nice and safe on our own machine. When we log into a machine, we're going to type SSH and then a username and the name of a computer. Uh, this is and we're going to log in. And ta-da, I logged in. What's happening here are a lot of other things that we're going to go over in just a moment. I have, so now I've logged in. I didn't have to say my password. I didn't have to wait too terribly long. I just typed that in. And now I can even log in like so. So SSH is just a way to use a shell like we saw in the previous video, but we're gonna use that shell someplace else besides our own local machine. So if I do SSH to the systems1.cs.us.edu machine, wait a little moment for it to connect, and it connects. And now I am logged in as the user CKNish on the host cs-sys1, and I am in my home directory on that machine. I am on UIC's campus, for the purposes of using this shell right now. And I have files on that machine. That's a machine running in a rack in the Roosevelt Road building. And I can do all sorts of things on it, pretty useful. So a few things happen behind the scenes that are super important that you'll probably want to keep track of when you start using SSH yourself. So three things, we're gonna go the easiest one up to the uh, most complicated one. Number one is that by default, whatever username you're using locally, SSH will use that to try to authenticate on the remote machine. Now, my username on my local home machine within the Linux world, within my WSL instance, is CKMish. That is also my NetID at UIC. So I don't have to do anything special to log in that way. However, if you have a different username on your WSL, or on your local machine than you have remotely at UIC, you are gonna to need to SSH with a username at a uh, individual machine. So if I wanna explicitly use a specific username, I just type it in at the name of the host, and that gets the job done. Pretty useful there. The other important part here is that I'm using an SSH private public key pair that I already created and installed on systems one. The next next thing is that I'm using something called an SSH agent uh, to log into that machine. So I have an SSH agent 
which has access to a key that I have created already. Uh, on Linux and Mac, if you just use it by default, then you're using something like Ubuntu or Mint or Debian, there will already be an SSH agent running whenever you log into the interactive graphical user interface there. And when you're on Mac, you'll also have an SSH agent running by default. On Windows, you do need to uh, install optional what is it? Uh, features. So on Windows, you do need to a uh, install the OpenSSH client, as well as go into services, find OpenSSH authentication agent, find its properties, and set it to automatic startup and start it up. I already have done that you know, a long time ago, and so mine is already ready to go. But once you have done those two things, you have SSH, the client program, you have the SSH agent running in the background, and that kind of brings you up to where your friends with Macs and Linux machines already are. So once you have your SSH agent running, it's kind of a place you can put keys that you can use to log into other places. Then super important thing that we haven't gone over yet here is how to create those keys. So uh, if I did not have access to that agent, let's start a new terminal. So here's a new terminal. I'm going to uh, find the environment variables that have to do with my agent. So I'm going to nuke both of those. So I'm going to unset SSH OSAC. I'm going to unset WSL OSAC. And now, as far as this specific shell is concerned, it doesn't know how to touch that SSH agent. So if I were to try to SSH into systems one, it's going to say, hey, you need to use a a key based on a password, or you need to enter in a password. That this is where you would be if you weren't able to log into those machines. So I'm going to, first off, remove this, uh, this key, because that was from a previous version of this talk. So if I want to be able to log into Systems 1, in this window, Let's pretend that we logged into Systems 1 using our password. And in this window, we're on our local machine, and we're going to create a SSH identity we're going to use to log into Windows. Or I'm sorry, we're going to create an SSH identity we're going to use to log into our CS machines at UIC. And we can actually use that SSH identity to log into GitHub as well, if we're going to be pushing and pulling from the command line. So if we want to create a key, we can generate a key using ssh-keygen. Uh, the defaults here for what type of key is totally fine. Uh, passphrase here, if this is your first SSH key, I would highly recommend that you give it a passphrase. So I'm going to do an example here with a very insecure passphrase. So now what we just did was we created a public key. This is the lock part in this file that called .pub, and a private key in this file called id underscore rsa. So let's go into that directory, and we can see these two new files that we just created right here. So if we cat id rsa, this is my public half of that key, and id rsa, and this is the private half of that key. So now that I have this public key, I can take it, and I can go over to my other window. And if I'm here and I go into the, I can create a .ssh directory if it doesn't already exist. Mine already exists. Yours probably will already exist. Go into it. I can create a authorized keys file. This already exists because I already have a, a key in it. This is my normal use all the time key. And I can add that thing. So I'm going to, nope, that's not what I want to paste. I want to paste this. I in Windows, it's really annoying. I'm going to select this text, and then I right-click on it. That puts it into the paste buffer. And over here, I don't have anything selected, and I right-click. It pastes what was in the paste buffer. We're in VI, so we escape colon right quit. Now we have those two identities that we can basically, I've installed that lock in my account at UIC, which basically says, if Somebody has a key to any of these locks, just let them into Chris's account. So if we come back over here, 
This is, yeah, so here we don't have any agent installed yet. We're just gonna manually log in using this key. So this key has the default name. So if I just log, if I just try right now to log in there, SSH is a smart enough program to know that it should try one of a few different common default file names for keys. Like it knows, oh, if it's in my home directory, under a directory called .ssh, and its name is IDRSA, it's probably an SSH key. And it's like, yep, you're smart. So when, when it finds that key and it sees that it's password protected, it asks me to type in the password. So if I type in the wrong password, it doesn't work. But if I type in the right super secure password, it's going to work and it's going to allow me to log in. Now that is the long and the short of using SSH to log into other machines. Now I have access to a shell, just like I have access to a shell and I can do all the fun stuff that I was able to do at uh, in the previous video. The next thing we want to cover is not having to type that password in every time. Because here I got to type that password in every time. And you know you could say, you know, Chris, I thought this was about getting faster at computer science. Why do I have to type the password in every single time? I would say, you're right, that's a really good point. And that leads me to my next topic, which is using an SSH agent. Now, agents get a little bit more complicated, especially with respect to security and how all that security stuff works. And the basic idea there is, why do we want to keep a key with a password, but then not type that password in every single time. What an agent allows us to do is type the password in once, either when we start the computer or when we come out of sleep, or just once when we put it into that computer's credential manager. And then we don't have to type it again based on our own personal security tolerance. Like if you wanna make sure that your key cannot be compromised even if your computer is on but asleep, you could say, okay, well, that's my risk tolerance. But then my inconvenience tolerance also means that I've got to type the password in every time my computer comes out of sleep. I don't do it at that level. On my home desktop, I have to type that password in just once, ever, and it goes into my Windows credential store. So if my computer's off and somebody steals it, you know, rips the hard drive out and wants to get access to my key, they won't be able to. Because without my Windows password, you're not going to be able to unlock the credential store in Windows to get access to that juicy password. This is what a lot of operating systems will have. They'll have these credential managers or key managers, things like this. What they'll do is they will encrypt every one of those important passwords in a way that it can only be decrypted with after you've logged into the account. If you're not logged into the account, it wipes out the memory where all of those decrypted passwords existed and all it has is the encrypted version of all of those passwords. So my credential manager in Windows has that. And every time I log into my machine using my Windows device password, it just decrypts that stuff for me. So I only really have to type that one password. In general, the fewer passwords that you have to type on a daily basis, the better, because then there's a higher likelihood that you'll be able to remember a long, unique password. Uh, I love security stuff. I'm sorry, but this is still important for systems programming and you know, your life as a computer scientist. So my personal recommendation is that you need to have password per device to log into that device, one password for your password manager, and then every other password you ever use should be stored in that password manager, except for those device passwords. And you wanna use two-factor authentication wherever possible. So that can mean using a YubiKey, that can mean using a two-factor authentication via your phone with those random six-digit codes, anything along those lines for an account that you consider even moderately sensitive, like your email account, certainly your bank account, things along those lines. Next thing that we wanna cover is using this SSH agent that we have installed. We want to start using the agent. So in this window, I'm gonna come back over to this window. So this window still has access to my SSH agent, but it only has that key installed. It doesn't have that new key installed. You want to install once and for all an SSH key with a password in Windows. I do SSH-add and then I type in the name of the file of the key. I type in its password and that identity is added. So every time I unlock my Windows machine, 
That key gets decrypted using the password, which gets saved in the Windows Credential Manager. So if I want to list, that's why I keep doing this SSH L that lists the identities available to me. I can use both of those identities to log into whatever machine I want to log into. So I can take uh, this file and I can copy and paste that into GitHub. I can copy and paste it into BERT VM. I can copy and paste it wherever I need to access things. And I'm not going to have to type that password in ever again. Super, super useful. So now I want to show how to, so let's do cat. Okay. So the next thing that I wanna show is how can I log into another machine that is further away from me than the first machine, I, the first hop I go to. So for instance, if I wanna SSH to get at github.com, this is a really, easy way to ask whether I have installed my SSH key correctly. When I do this, when I SSH into git at github.com and it shows me my username, I know that I've installed my key correctly and I'm using the key that I expect. However, if I were to go to systems one and then try the same thing, it's gonna yell at me. It's gonna say, you don't have permission to access this service. And then it's like, okay, that's because I don't have any identities in my agent. And I don't have any keys installed here on this machine, which is kind of what you're supposed to do. If I'm not using that machine, there's no good reason for me to have a key installed on that machine. If it's not the machine that's sitting in front of me, because I have access to SSH agent technology. So when I am using my agent here, and I trust the machine I'm hopping to, to send my key through it, I can edit my SSH config file. And really quick aside here, there's two super useful things we're gonna put in this SSH uh, config file. We're gonna say, okay, any host at uic.edu, I wanna do two important things. I wanna say my username is ckanish. So this is useful if your net ID isn't the same as your username on your local machine. And the other thing I wanna say is forward agent yes. So here, this is going to allow me to tell my computer underneath my desk that yes, I trust anything at UIC to send my key through it when I am using an SSH agent. Super, super useful. Now, if I SSH over to systems one and I do my SSH-L, SSH add-L, it's gonna show that I have access to those keys, even though those keys are nowhere to be found on this machine. They're being piped through that SSH connection coming from the machine under my desk. So if I SSH get at github.com again, it's gonna show me that I am K2, that works out fine. And everything is happy. That is super, super useful. There are other fun things that you can do with SSH. Besides what I've shown here, these are kind of like the absolute basics that I would recommend you be familiar with for the classes that I teach and lots of other classes here at UIC. Uh, one of the most interest, like one of the most useful things you can potentially do with SSH is use it as a proxy for your web browser. There's a way that you can log into a machine at UIC and then also kind of open a tunnel between your local machine and the machine you logged into such that when your browser browses the internet, it actually goes through that tunnel encrypted and comes out the other side from that machine at UIC. So if there's something like at the library or something on the ACM library that you wanna have access to, you can use SSH instead of having to set up the UIC proxy, which is like super annoying. Anyhow, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.